Uh-oh, that did not look good. Um, oh, Moo? I said a bit more nervous sounding than before. Joan, remain calm, please. A serious problem has developed. I will explain in one moment. Omu slumped a bit more and had to lean against the equipment cabinet to continue to support itself. After nearly 10 seconds, a small panel opened in the middle of its lower back. Inside was a crystal data module. Joan, remain calm. Please focus on the instructions I am about to give you. Act quickly. What the hell? First, remove the data module now exposed on my lower torso and keep it safe on your person. Next, quickly begin removing the data crystals in the open cabinet and place them into your backpack. After that, proceed to the surface with the backpack. Once on the surface, quickly drop every item of equipment and supplies we have on the surface, down the cylinder, into the alcove, and seal the hatch. I will then be out of direct contact with you. Oh, Mo, what the... Joan, listen to me. Oh, Mo interrupted my interruption. My head rang with the intensity of her mental message. After closing the hatch, Take just your flechette weapon in the backpack and run quickly back to the river in the waiting mini-sub. Once there, cut loose the mini-sub and the four aquatic drones. Again, as fast as possible, toss as much of the gear we have left at the river's edge into the river. Finally, enter the mini-sub and say the words Escape Mode 01. This will inform the mini-sub's partial intelligence that you are alone and in danger. The sub will expedite your return to Nautilus. If you encounter any of the patrolling biodrones while fleeing to the mini-sub, pause and while in eye contact with it, rapidly circle your right hand in the air with your index finger pointing skyward as if you were throwing a lasso. What the fuck? Begin now, move fast. I will continue to explain as you work retrieving the modules. I began to do as she asked. I first carefully removed the module from the recess in her back and placed it in my shorts pocket sealing the pocket just to be safe. I then began rapidly pulling data modules out of the old equipment housing and tossing them into the backpack. This would take a few minutes. Omu resumed speaking when I was busy pulling modules. I have made a serious mistake, Joan. I am sorry. In my attempt to reboot the operating intelligence here, I could not sustain enough energy flow to augment the already reduced power levels being supplied by the RTGs. The reboot attempt drained what power remained and caused some failsafe device under the floor to fall below a minimum preset threshold. This device triggered a scuttling charge to begin charging to detonation. Fuck. Oh, fuck, no. I tried to keep calm and not panic and just focus on pulling modules. The charging process rapidly drained much of my remaining energy before my circuit breakers tripped, stopping the rapid discharge, but the charge was successful. When I realized what was happening, I quickly resumed power flow, but rerouted the power to begin the reboot process only, hoping that would cause the scuttling device to pause to await a successful reboot. It did. Although the explosion will happen when the reboot process fails in its later stages, as it attempts to draw more power to fully activate the AI here. I was down to the last few modules and the bag was nearly full. I gave it a quick shake to settle the bag's contents. To prevent that from occurring, I am causing the reboot process to reset and restart every 0.4 seconds. This interrupts the process before it can begin to draw the higher power levels, but still pauses the scuttling charge detonation. I have enough energy remaining to continue the aborted reboot process cycles for approximately two hours and four minutes, Joan. After that, this location will be vaporized. I bagged the last module and turned to look at the little black humanoid unit. Its eyes were very dim. God damn it. Again, I am sorry, you must flee quickly. If you survive the explosion, know that the enemy AIs will certainly notice and may come to investigate. Oh, Muth. Please, Joan, go quickly. You must save yourself. Good luck, Mike. My friend. Shit. I scrambled to the ladder and struggled to climb while carrying the backpack strap in one hand. The ladder rungs were wet as it was now raining hard topside. As I climbed, I asked, do you know how big the explosion will be? I estimate that the small fusion device will cause an explosion yielding between five to eight kilotons of your TNT. Joan, the good news, if there is any, is there will be little radiation. 
This chamber will direct most of the prompt radiation skyward, and the prevailing winds are away from the coast. I almost lost my grip when I heard that. Eight kilotons. The explosion would be like a small nuke. Well, not so small, really, as eight kilotons was half the size of the Hiroshima bomb. I reached the service and tossed the bag away from the open hatch. I scrambled out and quickly retrieved all of our tools and gear nearby and tossed them down the hole. I was carrying the last load when I noticed Jake come into view. I stopped and waved at the jackal wildly. When I saw that it had noticed me and was watching, I did as Omu instructed and circled my raised right arm quickly with my finger pointed skyward. Jake stared at me for a moment and then took off running to the north and back to the river. A flapping of wings nearby startled me and I turned to see Jonathan take off and fly above the tree cover. Good, both bio drones would be saved that just left Otto. I hoped I would run into the otter, but I was not about to go looking for it. Back at the hatch, I tossed the load of gear into the darkness below and closed the heavy metal cover. Tears were streaming down my face as I grabbed the backpack full of modules and quickly put it on. Then with my flechette gun in my hands, I started running north, hot on Jake's trail. I wiped my damp eyes and put my goggles on as it was beginning to rain harder. The goggles were doing a great job repelling the rain, and the breath mask had kicked into a higher gear to handle my labored breathing. I had run a few hundred meters before I realized that I had better watch my backside occasionally, as fleeing prey was just what would trigger a leopard to instinctively chase an attack. I made the first kilometer in under 10 minutes. Gasping, I stopped for a moment to catch my breath before walking backwards slowly for another minute with the weapon ready. After I had rested in that manner for another minute, I resumed jogging facing forward. I wondered how much time had passed and how much time I had left before the explosion. I glanced at my fancy watch and saw that it now displayed a countdown. One hour and 42 minutes. Oh, Moo, I said short of breath. No answer. The range must be too great or the unit had too little power or both. Watch, I panted. Yes, was the simple answer I heard in my head. Can you warn me every 10 minutes? I asked out loud. Yes. Good, the watch had enough brains to do that much at least. I made it back to the mini sub's location in 15 more minutes. I was covered with rain and sweat and panting for air as I dropped the backpack into the now open hatch of the sub. The watch must have relayed the news of the crisis to the mini sub's partial intelligence because it came alive and began to pump out ballast water in preparation for freeing itself from the sandbar. This also gave me the slack I needed to easily untie and remove the anchoring lines. I tossed these into a deep hole in the river and went to untie the aquatic drones from their anchors on shore. I noticed that Jake's cylinder was sealed with him already inside. When I untied the drones, George's and Jonathan's quickly departed. Otto's remained, and I hoped the little otter would show up in the next minute or it was not escaping. I looked around quickly but did not see any sign of the otter. Watch! Signal Otto's aquatic drone to wait submerged here near shore for one half hour, then depart to return to Nautilus if the bio drone does not show up. Affirmative. I looked around the shore area and tossed any of our remaining gear that I could find either in the river or in the mini sub if it would not sink. Last, I entered the sub myself and sealed the hatch. The moment the hatch was sealed, the sub spoke up. Please confirm expedited emergency return. I had to think for a few seconds before I remembered the phrase Omu had told me to say. Escape mode 01, I said. The sub surged forward and we began traveling down the river. I looked at my watch and saw that we had 40 minutes remaining. Sub, can we travel faster submerged or on the river's surface? This vessel will travel 12% faster on the surface, the voice said. Well, the day is rainy and cloudy, so screw it. Better risk the surface. Sub, do not dive until I tell you to. Travel as fast as possible on the surface, I said. What a ride. I sat on my ass near the middle of the sub, watching the river water split around the clear front bubble. We were moving at well over five knots. If we could maintain this speed, we could be back to Nautilus in four hours. But we would have to slow and submerge before the explosion and remain submerged the rest of the way to Nautilus. I figure I looked at my watch at least five times a minute over the next half hour. I finally had to force myself to not look and instead found some food bars and got myself a beverage. This combined with the excitement meant I had to piss. 
so I resorted to going into an empty waterproof bag I held between my legs. It worked better than I had hoped, and luckily the bag was large enough to hold my urine without overflowing. I was back to waiting as the clock approached the final 10 minutes. At five minutes, I told the sub to submerge and travel as stealthy as possible. I could only imagine the amount of satellite and aerial drones that would be focused on this area over the next few hours, days, and weeks. I began to realize that I might not be alive much longer. My watch beeped as the detonation time came and went. I continued to wait nervously, not knowing what to expect. OMU held out three minutes longer than she had estimated. After two minutes, I had begun to hope that maybe she had found a way to stop the explosion. I was just about ready to tell the submarine to halt when I saw the water light up with the flash. The surface of the river grew very bright for a few seconds before slowly fading back down to normal over the next half minute. Apparently the distance the mini-sub had been able to travel was sufficient to provide enough separation from the explosion that its effects were limited. There was only a brief surge of motion as the shockwave traveled through, through the river. I had survived the detonation and slumped in relief as some of the worry and adrenaline faded. As I sat there, I imagined Omu's last moments alone down in the small, dark, ancient bunker. I could picture her faint, glowing eyes finally growing dim and dark as the last of her power reserves were exhausted. The chamber's AI now free to complete its own self-destruction. Goodbye, my little friend. You did your best and I hope it will be enough. I felt tears streaming down my face as I sat there in the growing darkness. Why the hell was I getting so upset about the loss of a machine? Get a grip, John. Still, it was clear that Omu had been more than just a machine. There was no way in hell that the AI, which had been at the heart of her android body, had not evolved past an unthinking computer program. Just what she had become, I could not say. All I knew was that I missed my friend. I felt her dad a backup module in my pocket. Hopefully, Naomi would be able to do something with it. It must be close to nightfall above. The mini-sub had slowed to a crawl as it worked to maximize stealth and also avoid fast collisions with any underwater obstacles. I was in no mood to help navigate and let the sub's partial AI control our course using its inertial navigation. At our current low speed, we would spend at least another whole day traveling down the river to the open ocean, and once there, the danger would only increase as more and more of the enemy's presences and mobile units were brought in to investigate. Eventually, I fell into a fitful sleep on the floor of the mini-sub. The next day brought more boredom and suspense. I was cramped in the small compartment, but dared not stop long enough to surface the sub and stretch my legs. The best I could do was to contort myself around the narrow cylinder and stretch in place. Every few hours, I would pause the mini-sub under a portion of the river with trees overhead and slowly extend the sensor mast above the surface. I saw nothing near the river on the imager, but the sensors did detect many transmissions to and from enemy aerial drones flying to and from the site of the explosion. All hell was breaking loose on the surface. I kept the sub as deep as I could in the channel of the river and slowed us even further. In the daylight, I was able to keep the low mounted forward lights on low to help us see underwater obstacles and give us a bit of warning against collision. Such objects would appear in the murky water quickly and more than once there was a thud as we bumped onto a submerged log, boulder, or some other debris. A half kilometer from the mouth of the river, I was jarred from a drowsy nap by a loud metallic clank. Instead of another collision, the mini-sub's brain indicated that it had rendezvoused with one of the aquatic drones from Nautilus and was exchanging data. After a minute, the drone detached and sped off back to Nautilus. I was relieved that at least Naomi would receive the most recent data on what had happened back at the target coordinate site. I was not sure if Jonathan had made it back or how much information the seagull could have carried on what had taken place. With the aquatic drone's rendezvous, I felt Naomi would get the full picture. Naomi had also relayed to us that she had taken Nautilus further offshore as a response to the new enemy activity. With the increase in the numbers of active enemy mobile units and aerial drones, Nautilus was now sitting on the bottom alongside an old sunken ship at a depth of nearly 400 meters. The sub's new location was at the extreme outer limits of the mini-sub's current remaining range, and I would need to spend almost another entire day stuck inside. I was thinking about how tired, hungry, and dirty I would be when I finally made it back when suddenly the world lit up bright. 
The river flared with a blinding glare, an order of magnitude brighter than the blast from the old bunker had caused. I covered my eyes quickly, but still was partially blinded. The control area of the mini-sub emitted a crackle and with a few sparks shorted out. My ears detected a strange tone as the brightness peaked. The glare faded and I blinked trying to clear my eyes. For a few confused seconds, I wondered what the hell had happened when I realized suddenly that it had been another nuclear explosion. This one had been either much, much larger or much closer or both. I had only moments to begin to worry when, wham, the sub and much of the river surged to the north. My head hit the mini sub's hull and everything went dark. Epilogue, year 2917, five years after the events in Sri Lanka. Location, mid-equatorial orbit, Earth. The enormous armored processor cluster was slowly moved to its final resting place at the center of the recently constructed large orbital station. Processor operations in the cluster did not pause during this final installation because the master artificial intelligence housed within its circuitry dare not relinquish control for even a microsecond. It had sufficient internal backup power reserves for times just like this and could remain active for days if need be while not connected to external power. The one consequence of the final installation which the master intelligence could not circumvent was that its communications with the other lesser artificial intelligences distributed in nearby space and on the surface of the planet below were at a much lower bandwidth than was optimal. Still, despite the lower bandwidth, the master intelligence remained fully active, scanning nearby, and not so nearby, space for any threats to itself or the installation during this period of vulnerability. It maintained full control of the numerous defensive weapons arrays scattered across the surface of the new orbital station, and it watched through its own sensors for any movement in the busy orbital space around it. When motions were noticed, it quickly verified friend or foe status of the detected objects. So far, all such moving objects were found to be on their proper missions and courses and no weapons had needed to be used. Every single one of its intelligence presences on the world below was currently in lockdown and slave to monitoring the orbital installation. Each of them had all available sensors watching their own locations, as well as trained heavenward when the station's orbital location allowed. Nothing threatening was noticed and the relocation proceeded as planned. The master AI periodically reviewed the history of its relocation journey from the asteroid 3074 Popov to its current location in Earth orbit. Nothing unexpected had happened in space during that journey and all had gone according to plan. During its transit, only one incident of note had happened early on. A strange explosion had occurred on a small island in the eastern hemisphere of the planet. Once the master AI had learned of the strange explosion, it had immediately ordered an extensive investigation. Even now, years later, much about the incident remained unclear. At first, the master artificial intelligence had feared rogue activities or an attack of some sort on itself or one of its presences. But the explosion had occurred dozens of kilometers from any of its AI presences or operations, and none of its mobile units had come up missing or any of its infrastructure damaged. Still, as a precaution, it had immediately put all of its presences and field bases on the planet under full lockdown and alert. The master AI next instructed the nearby bases and presences to send a great number of aerial and surface mobile units or drones to the location in southwestern Sri Lanka to investigate. When the first of these arrived, they reported a strange mix of data. First, the physical crater was relatively small at approximately 80 meters across and 40 meters deep. Had there been an impact from space? Its sensors had not detected any. The small explosion size was still clearly large enough to be easily detected by the orbital satellites. This ruled out any attempt to destroy something in secret, but the size remained much smaller than any weapon the master intelligence would have used for its own purposes. They also reported the detection of a strange mix of neutron-activated radiological elements and isotopes. This indicated that the explosion had been caused by some type of nuclear reaction. One possibility was that the explosion was caused by a leftover human-created nuclear weapon. The lack of any detected uranium or plutonium residue in the fallout made that theory improbable. In any case, the island had not been a strategic location where such weapons had been stored 
or even likely targeted. Also, the small size of the explosion was also well below most fission or fission fusion devices known to have once been wielded by humans. A second option was that the source of the explosion was a pure fusion device, similar to the technology used by the master AI. This would explain much of the neutron activation, but not the high levels of americium and neptunium also detected. Again, the small size of the explosion negated that theory also. The explosion had occurred during the local rainy season, and the crater was found to already be partially flooded when the larger drones had arrived. The flooding and erosion had obscured much of the site, and the extensive survey of the surrounding jungle had discovered nothing suspicious. The machine intelligence reviewed the data archives of its field bases on the island. It noted nothing unusual or unexpected happening over the past few centuries of its activities there. The data records of the orbital satellites were also scrutinized with nothing notable occurring near that location. Still, something had caused the explosion and the master AI ordered precautionary measures. The first of these was to trigger the embedded fusion device at the closest of its operations near the location of the explosion. This was the small remediation base located south of the old Seaport Peninsula in the former city of Colombo. The base's proximity to the unexplained event made it suspect and possibly compromised. The fusion device had caused a large detonation, 16 megatons as measured in the old human method of sizing such things, and destroyed an area almost 20 kilometers across. The resulting crater was half a kilometer deep. Its location near the seaport breached the shoreline and quickly flooded the crater with seawater. The island would have a new seaport once the radiation was dealt with. The next measure was to land a series of picket units around the southern portion of the small island. Each contained sensitive scanners and also its own large fusion device. If any new threats arose in the area, it would be instantly annihilated. The orbital launching facility on the south end of the island was scrutinized. It sent investigative landers to that location to reboot the operating AI presence. All cargoes shipped to space since the facility began operation were also investigated thoroughly. Nothing suspicious was found, either at the base or among the items now in orbit. The final measure was to immediately construct and launch a series of drop capsules down to the surface to all other bases worldwide, which contained an AI presence. These locations would be fully scanned and the controlling intelligences there rebooted with fresh operating instructions. It would also have the local mobile units do a full physical scan of the nearby areas. Even the nine humans currently in biosuspension at various locations around the world would be scanned. It had debated what to do about the experimentation and nursery colony in the Western Amazon basin. The humans there roamed freely over a large area and it could not fully scan all of them, so it considered culling them all. In the end, it was decided to let them remain alive. It did order the construction of thousands of additional monitoring stations to be spread about the area for increased surveillance. After months of further intense study and review, the artificial intelligence had still reached no consensus on the cause. The current leading theory was that some unknown rogue probe waiting dormant in the local solar system had for some reason attempted re-entry over the small island and detonated on impact. It finally concluded that there was no danger to itself or its mission and reduced the number of processor cycles it was devoting to the mystery. Gradually, the machine intelligence had returned its primary focus to its own activities on the newly constructed station circling the Earth. Its arrival had gone well, and the current installation was proceeding optimally. It looked forward to completing its installation into the orbital station and beginning the next phases of its operations in this system.